All right. So, how are y'all this morning? Good. Everybody's good? All right. So today I kind of want to just talk to you about life. Is that okay? I know some of y'all are thinking, like, Tim, you're only like 25. What can you tell me about life? <laughs> I'm not 25. The people who know me were laughing, right? All right. So I'm kind of old, but that's all right. I don't really want to just talk about uh, physical life. I'd like to talk a little bit about spiritual life too, if that's okay with y'all today. We're going to talk a little bit about spiritual stuff. Jesus used to do this when he used to tell parables, right? And so a parable is basically just a physical story with a spiritual meaning. You ever heard of that? Okay. And so I also believe that parables can offer us a spiritual perspective and it allows the Holy Spirit to, to shine some light on some things that he may want us to work on. Okay. It gives us an opportunity to fix those things. And so that's kind of where we want to, that's kind of where I want to land today is I, I want us to just talk in a physical way. But what I want you to do is I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit as we go today. Okay. Cause we're going to be talking like a parable, but he's going to be talking to us like a spiritual life. Okay. You got it? All right, so I got a couple of props this morning. I want to introduce you to my little friends, right? All right, so this is, this is a mirror. All right, everybody with me? Okay, so we're going to be using this today. Um, at each point in the, in the uh, message today, when we get to the end of each section, we're going to, or I'm going to approach this mirror, and I'm going to look at myself in this mirror, and I'm going to ask myself some questions, okay? Because what I think is important is not just to hear the Word, but then to allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you and examine yourself and see where you are, okay? So this is what I want you to do. Everybody ready? Do your fingers like this. And I want you to draw a little box in front of you. Some of those were ovals. All right. <clears throat> this is your mirror, okay? This is your imaginary mirror, okay? All right? And so when we get to that point and I walk to this mirror and I ask you some questions, what I want you to do, I don't want to have to tell you now, I want you to make your little mirror and, and in your imagination, I want you to picture that you are looking at yourself in this mirror and you're asking yourself these questions. Can we do that? Awesome. Okay. And then my other little friend over here, um, my buddy Jonathan allowed me to use this uh, and it fell over during worship because the drums were rocking so hard. And then I hope, I hope it didn't break it or anything because he threatened me. So, um, but I just figured we're talking about trees today. Just so you know, we're going to talk about plant life. And so I just thought it'd be cool to have some kind of plant here that we could reference to and just kind of understand what we're talking about. Okay. All right. Cool. So, it's interesting that Jesus uses plant life a lot in his parables. Have you ever noticed that? Like the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the vineyards. Like if you go through the New Testament, that dude is talking about some plants. And not only that, he, talks about, he uses 12 different parables in the New Testament where he talks about plants. He talks about plants a lot. I believe one of the reasons that he talks about plants so much is because the people in that day, they understood plants and they could relate to it. Either they were growing plants to eat or they were growing plants to sell for livelihood, but their life depended on plants back then. And so he wanted to be able to talk to them in a way where they would understand. I think another reason that he talked about plants is because they're his creation. Whether we're talking about humans or whether we're talking about um, animals or whether we're talking about plants, all of those are his creation, and they display his majesty and his wisdom. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? When you look at his creation, you can see his majesty. And a lot of things, if you look close enough, they'll display his wisdom as well. And we're going to look at that this morning. So, what better place to start than a parable, right? I figured that'd be a good place to start. Y'all agree? All right, so we're going to look at John 15, 1 through 8. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John 15. 1 through 8. If you don't have the word with you, it'll be here on the screen. So John 15, 1 through 8 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words, words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. That's what we want, right? 
We, we want to be proven to be Jesus' disciples, correct? And so this is a really good parable, and I believe it sheds a whole light about life in Christ. It sh shines a lot of light on life in Christ, okay? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of break it into three little sections to kind of explain a little better. So the first section we're going to break it into is called the dead tree. All right? So we're just going to talk about a dead tree for a second. Is that okay with y'all? Okay? All right. So I heard y'all doing worship. Y'all are real responsive. I better get some amens all I know here what I'm saying. All right. So I'll be right back. I'm going to grab something. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Pot and soil over here. All right. Okay. So I thought it'd be cool to bring this today. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of show you. So I, what I want to do is I want to talk about some attributes of a dead tree, okay? And y'all can follow along with me, but what I want you to hear and what we're talking about, okay, parables, it's a physical story with a spiritual meaning. And so what I want you to do is I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you while we talk, okay? All right. So here's the first attribute of a dead tree. Are you ready? A dead tree is brittle and dry and it breaks under pressure, right? Right? I went and grabbed this beauty this morning. Um, actually, excuse me, last night. I keep saying I said that in last service too. It's a lie. Um, I grabbed this last night, and uh, I was like, man, this would be a really good um, display. So I figured I would show you all how brittle it is, and it would... Um, I'm just kidding. Man, y'all think I'm weak. Look, <laughs> this thing is so dead. It's so dry. Look, it just broke. It just snapped. Any, any amount of pressure on a dead tree will just cause it to fall apart. All right? So that's the first attribute. A dead tree is dry and brittle, and it breaks under pressure. Um, the second uh, characteristic of a dead tree is this, it is not actively pursuing a purpose. It's dead. Okay? So just hear me out. Anything that lives is pursuing a purpose. If it's a dog, it's for the dog tree. Right? If it's a... Uh, I don't know. Let's think of something. If it's a tree, it's to produce fruit. But, but whatever it is, if it has life, it is living for some kind of purpose, whether it's its own purpose or somebody else's purpose, there is purpose. But a dead tree is not living for any purpose. There is no purpose. Okay? Here's another one. A dead tree... Oh, I'm sorry. A dead tree, after it's been dead for a while, is no longer identifiable. So let me ask you a question. How do you identify a tree? Somebody tell me. It's leaves, yes. And so if you're walking, yes, by the fruit, you were right, but, but mainly by the leaves. And so when you're walking through the woods and you say, all right, well, there's a sweet gum tree because that's a sweet gum leaf, and then that's an oak tree because it's got an oak leaf, and there's a bay tree. And some of you are like, what the heck is a bay tree? Does it only grow in the bay? I don't know. But you can look at a tree and you can tell by its leaves what kind of tree it is. Let me ask you, what's the first thing to go when a tree dies? The leaves. That's right. Okay? And so then you're walking through the woods, you're trying to figure out what kind of tree this is because it ain't got no leaves on it. So then what do you look for? You look for the bark, right? So you get up close to the tree and you're like, okay, well, well, this has bark like a pine tree or it has bark like an oak tree or, or whatever, but, but it has some kind of identifier on it. But have you ever seen an old log laying across in the woods and the termites are in it and the ants have gotten on it and it ain't got no bark on it? The old deer's come and rubbed all the bark out of it. Come on, deer hunters. Y'all know, right? It doesn't have any bark on it. The longer a tree is dead, the less identifiable it becomes. Okay? The longer it's dead, the less identifiable it comes. All right, here's the last one. Dead trees. The only impact they make on their environment is when they impact the ground when they fall. The only impact they make on their environment is when they hit the ground and fall. And guess what? If there's a whole lot of healthy trees around it, guess what happens? It causes a whole lot of chaos and damage on the way down. It affects all of the healthy trees around it, breaking limbs, knocking leaves out. I mean, like, that's the truth, man. When a dead tree falls, it creates a lot of damage and chaos. Okay? So let me ask you, have y'all seen any dead trees lately? John 15, 6 says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Listen, Jesus said, If you do not remain in me. So it's easy to think on the surface that he's talking about non-believers. You know, people that never believed in him and all that kind of stuff. But listen, it says, If you do not remain in me, is his words. Let me, let me just give you a quick little tip. You can't remain in something that you've never been in. 
You can't remain in a car that you've never sat in. You can't remain in a house that you've never been in. Okay? You can't remain in a club that you've never been a member of. You understand what I'm saying? And so what he's saying is, I'm not talking to other people. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to believers. And what he's saying is, if you don't remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. But Jesus uses the words remain in me to help us understand what we need to know. I think it's also, this also applies to people who have experienced being connected to the source and have become disconnected. They don't remain in him anymore. He says, if we don't remain in him, we are like that branch that's dead. Right? We're like this. We're brought dry. We're brittle. We're not living for a purpose. The only impact we're really going to make is the impact when we hit the ground. So that brings me to my first truth. It's when life is absent, the signs are evident. So if you're taking notes this morning and you want to you write that down, we'll say it one more time. When life is absent, the signs are evident. You see, the truth is, is that the absence of life is obvious. No leaves, no fruit, no life. Okay? So let me ask you, do you think it's obvious to others that the tree is dead? Do you think it's obvious to God that the tree is dead? Absolutely. Do you think it's obvious to the tree that it's dead? Maybe. Maybe not. And that's why I think it's so important for us to self-reflect. So maybe today you're, you're kind of saying, all right, I might be a dead tree. I don't know. I'm identifying with the dead tree a little bit. Um, so how did I even get here? Like, how did the dead tree even become dead? Listen to this. Why is the dead tree dead? Maybe it was in an environment that didn't support life. Did you know that the surroundings of a tree can greatly affect its life and growth? Did you know that? Did you know if the environment's not right, it'll kill a tree? So let me ask you, what do you what's your friends and your social influence look like? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> man, you made me lose track. Maybe disease. <laughs> Here we go. So maybe disease or an infestation started from the inside and eventually overtook the tree. You know, rot can start on the inside of a tree or an infestation can start on the inside of a tree and they can just eat that tree up. And before you know it, it's too late. It's over with. So let me ask you, do you have unforgiveness or bitterness or self-justified sin that's destroying you from the inside? Maybe it's prolonged drought or cold season and it's just disabled the tree. That's what killed it. You know, like if you go without the necessary resources for long enough, it'll kill you. Right? So let me ask you. Are you in a season where you're just pushing away from God? You're creating this drought. You're creating this cold, cold snap or whatever it is that's depriving you of the necessity, necessities you need for life. Here's the last reason it may be dead. Maybe there was never life to begin with. Maybe there was never life to begin with. Maybe it was never really connected to a source. And maybe you've never been truly connected to a source. So here's what I want to do. Y'all ready? We're going to the mirror. Try. All right, good job. Okay, all right, we got some listeners over here. Listeners, I uh, see y'all. All right, so go ahead and draw your mirror. And it, look, this is fun, but it's also imaginary. What I want you to do is I want you to just reflect, okay? I want you to think about these questions earnestly and just ask God, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you, okay? You ready? Here's the first question. Am I a dead tree? And so you can just ask, answer yes or no, okay? Am I a dead tree? Are there signs of life in Christ? Am I identifiable as a follower of Christ? Am I pursuing his purposes for my life rather than mine? Have I ever fully trusted Christ with my life, job, finances, marriage, family, everything? So for the ones that say, I think that's me, I think I'm dead, 
what can I do? Um, I would tell you, it's easy. You need to get connected to the source. And if at some point in your life you have come disconnected from the source and you didn't realize it, you need to get reconnected. It's that simple. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. So the second, second tree I want to talk about today is, uh, we're going to call it the ornamental tree, okay? And uh, you're like, what the heck is an ornamental tree, Tim? And so it's kind of like, so this is an ornamental tree, right? It don't produce any fruit. It's just kind of like pretty, right? All right, so the ornamental tree is like that tree that's in the lobby of the hotel, like them bougie bushes you got in front of your house. Some of y'all, some of y'all don't have them bushes, but I do. Don't be judging me, right? But, but some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And so that's what an ornamental tree is, okay? And so what I want to do is I want to look, uh, look at some attributes of an ornamental tree, but I just kind of want to like insert a warning here, okay? I'm about to get all up in your business, okay? I just want you to know, and it's not me. I'm just telling you what the Spirit says and what the Word says. So the Holy Spirit's about to get all up in your business. I just want you to know. All right. So an ornamental tree, the first uh, characteristic of an ornamental tree or a tree with no fruit is it has signs of life like leaves and flowers, and it's doing all the things it thinks is required for life. It's doing all the things that it thinks it should to, to make everybody believe that it's a tree. Okay? It's doing all the things it thinks is required. Number two, it provides homes for animals and shade and can easily be a centerpiece of a garden, right? That ornamental tree, boy, I can be the centerpiece of my garden. You know what I mean? Like, like self-centered. Its purpose is found in its own abilities. Okay? The third one is because it has life, it has memory, and always springs back to its natural posture. Let me tell you, um, growing up as a kid, me and my brother used to run through the woods. Um, he's a lot skinnier than me, or he used to be. Um, <laughs> he, is, uh, he used to be a lot littler, and he was a whole lot faster than me. So when we would run through the woods, you know, no shirt on, cut off blue jeans, barefooted, you know, we was country, I'm just telling you. And so we'd be running through the woods, and he'd be right in front of me. And you know what he would do? I'm going to show you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so he'd be running, we'd be running, and he would reach out and grab a limb and just run with it for a second and then let that mug go. Well, what happened? Pow! Pow! <laughs> and, and depending on how big the limb was is how hard I would holler. I mean, like, it, was just, it would just stroke you. You know what I'm saying? And so anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is, is that there is a, just a natural posture that a lot of trees will take. And it's like, well, that's the way it grows. It must be supposed to be growing like that. And if you try to make it grow any other way, you can bend it and pull it or whatever, and it's always going to pop back to that natural posture. Am I right? And so just so you know, you have sin in your life, and you are a sinful person, and you have natural sinful desires. And no matter how much you try to pull yourself back into that place, you're always going to pop back into that, that original position, Okay? but there's a way around that, and I'll tell you in a minute. Another attribute of an ornamental tree is it looks pretty, but outside of what it was designed for, it's useless. All right? How many of y'all seen Karate Kid? You know? And Mr. Miyagi? You know? Thank you. All right, so, so basically, you know, he's got the little bonsai tree, and he has the little tiny scissors, and he's like trimming the little bonsai tree so it looks all pretty. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And, and yes, yes, maybe the bonsai tree made for a good hobby for him. And yes, maybe it brought him inner peace to sit there and trim with those baby scissors like the little nose hair scissors or whatever. I don't know. But after he's done and after it goes on the shelf, what else is it doing? It's looking pretty. But other than that, pretty much useless, right? So outside of Outside of what it was designed for, an ornamental tree is useless. It doesn't produce fruit. Oh, here's one. It's identifiable by what it proclaims, not what it produces. Let me say that one more time. An ornamental tree is identified by what it proclaims, but not what it produces. Y'all ever heard of a popcorn tree? Y'all know what a popcorn tree is? Okay, it's a big old tree. Well, they, when they grow up, they're big. And like when they go into bloom, it's white blooms, and the whole top looks like you just popped a whole bunch of popcorn. And as a kid, we didn't have popcorns in our yard. 
popcorn tree, excuse me. But we had a friend who had popcorn trees, and uh, I remember going over to his house one time, and I was pumped because we were going to get to see a popcorn tree, and I was going to get me some popcorn. And so we're driving up the driveway, and I see the popcorn tree, and I'm like, yeah, we get up in the, I mean, like, get there, doors fling open, and I'm out the car. Run up to it, there's some popcorn on the ground. It don't taste like popcorn. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you all, it tastes like grass is what it tastes like, Okay. But the fact is, is that the popcorn tree proclaims to be something that is not. It's not really a popcorn tree. That's not really popcorn. Some old lady just named it that, you know, just to be funny, like, oh, look at my popcorn tree, right? But it's, it proclaims to be something that it's not. And then the last, the last characteristic that I want to tell you about, about an ornamental tree is super simple, and I don't even have to explain it. It does not produce fruit. An ornamental tree doesn't produce fruit, Okay. If it produced fruit, it would be called a bam. All right. So let me just say this. For some of y'all, the Holy Spirit's already kind of talking to you. And you've even kind of forgotten that we're even talking about trees because he's talking to you so hard. So let me just say real quick, just, just stick with me for a second, okay? All right? Let's look back at what it says in verse 1 and 2 of John 15. John 15, 1 and 2 says... I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Listen, notice that it said God is the gardener, okay? And he cuts off every branch that doesn't bear fruit. Listen to me. It may not be that you disconnected from the source, but it may be that you were disconnected for a lack of fruit. Now hear me out, because I know some of y'all are looking at me all crazy right now. Hear me out. Let's read it one more time. It says, I am the true vine. Jesus is the true vine, correct? And my Father is the gardener. So God's the dude walking around with the shears. Okay, He's tending the garden. He keeps the garden healthy. And he says, He, God, cuts off every branch in me. So when we talk about us being saved, we say we're in Christ, like we're in him, right? And Jesus said, I'm the vine. And then later he says, he cuts off every branch that is in me. So guess who he's talking about? He's talking about us. And it says that he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And so I say to you, maybe you didn't disconnect from God, but maybe you were disconnected because you were claiming to be something and you were not producing that thing. Okay? So you know, Jesus encountered a tree with, without fruit one time. Did y'all know about that? Let me tell you about it. It's in Mark eleven twelve through 14. I'll read it kind of fast. It says, The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. And then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. If you ever said something that was kind of like crude or crass and then somebody heard you say it and you was like, oh, you know what I mean? But Jesus said it like he didn't care. He was like, may nobody ever eat fruit from you again. Why? I just want to pull a couple of things from that scripture just real fast. Listen, the first thing is it says Jesus was hungry. And what I want you to understand from that is Jesus desired fruit from that plant, and he desires fruit from his children. Amen. Okay. Number two, Jesus spotted the fig tree from a distance. It says it was a fig tree in leaf. And I can only imagine that it says that because that's how you identify a plant. And so from a distance, he looked and he sees a plant, a fruit-bearing plant, and he says, I'm hungry. Right? And so he says, I'm going to go over there and get me some figs. But then he gets over there, and there's no fruit. Right? Right? So I just want to share with you that uh, some fruit are some are fruit by tree, fruit trees only by name and not by action. Let me say that again because I was stammering. Some are fruit trees only by name and not by action. And then the last thing, Jesus curses the tree. So maybe he was hungry, maybe he was hangry. I don't know. But what the fact is is that when he got over there, he wanted fruit. When he got over there, it didn't have any fruit, and he was displeased. Okay. He desired fruit from what claimed to be a fruit tree. So this brings us to our second truth that I want to share with you this morning. Don't be fooled. God desires fruit from those who claim to be fruit trees. Let me say it one more time in case you're writing it. Don't be fooled. 
God desires fruit from those who claim to be fruit trees. And so you may be saying, Tim, that's a fig tree. That's a fruit tree. It's not an ornamental tree. You dummy. I'm like, okay, all right, all right. So I know, I know the fig tree is a fruit tree. But let me ask you a question. What's worse, a tree that does not claim to be a fruit tree and does not produce fruit? Or a tree that does claim to be a fruit tree and does not produce fruit? What's worse? And what I would say to you is, it's the tree that says, hey, 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 I'm a fruit tree. I'm a fruit tree. Look at me. Look at me. And then you get there and you lean in because you you actually may be in a hard spot in life and you need the fruit that comes from a fruit tree. And you lean in and you realize, no fruit. So James puts it this way. James 2, 14, 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? Listen, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. One more time. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So let me clear something up. I'm not saying right now that you've got to produce some, produce some fruit to prove that you're saved, okay, because that's the wrong. You, you don't strive to produce fruit. It's, that's not how it works. But look, there's a fruit that comes from a person who naturally has gratitude because of the price that was paid on the cross for them. There's an outward response from an inward change. And, and fruit just comes. You don't strive to produce fruit. And what this is saying is, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by fruit, is dead. What I'm saying is that there's fruit that comes from a person who trusts God completely that's effortless. It's an outward response of an inward change. You see, there are people wandering around that are hopeless, and they're looking for hope, and they see hope on you and they lean in for the fruit that that hope produces and when they don't find it, they're left more confused and more hopeless than when they began. Brennan Manning has a quote and it's a super old quote. You might have heard it before but I think it's relevant. It says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So maybe today you're identifying with the ornamental tree. Um, Maybe you're wondering, why aren't I producing fruit? So let's look at some reasons why, why an ornamental tree would not produce fruit. You ready? Why is it not producing fruit? Why would a fruit tree not be producing fruit? Did you know that if you plant a plum tree in your yard and there's not another plum tree for 100 miles around, you won't have plums. Did you know that? There has to be another plum tree within a certain distance of your tree to cross-pollinate, right? The pollen from that tree has to pollinate your tree and vice versa. Otherwise, it'll never produce fruit, right? I've learned that the hard way. You pay all that money for a fruit tree and you plant it and don't ever do nothing. All it is is a good switch bush. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, like, it, it, I learned it the hard way. Listen, it's the same for believers. We need to be an intentional community with other mature believers. It's possible that it needs a little fertilizer on the roots. You know, sometimes a tree is not getting the nutrients that it needs, and you start, it starts looking kind of wimpy, and you, know, you, you can tell like you need to do something. And so what do you do? You bust up the ground around it, and you go get you some miracle Grow, right? And I don't know, I like the shaky kind, but some of y'all boozy, y'all got that the thing that sprays out. I don't know, but the, you put some fertilizer on it and what happens? It springs right back, doesn't it? Right? And the reason it does that is because it needed nutrients. And can I share with you that the way that you get nutrients is from the word of God on a daily basis. Can I, can I say something that might be a little offensive? I think some, some of us come here and we think this is the time where we get our nutrients and this is the only time that we encounter God throughout the week. And what I'm telling you is, is that you are deficient. And it's not because the word that's coming from up here is not good enough, but this is just supposed to be a time where we come, and t- come together and celebrate and you get a little bit of the word and it boosts you for the week. But where you get the fertilizer, where you get the nutrients is when you get into the word every single day and the Lord talks to you and the Holy Spirit starts working in you. And man, talk about a plant springing back. 
Try it. So what's another uh, reason um, that it might not be producing fruit? It may not be growing in a way to support the weight of fruit. Did you know in orchards, like they do things like pruning them and, and, you know, we talked about the limb slapping back down, but what they'll actually do is they'll bring a limb so that it can support more weight. They'll bring it in, tie a rope around it and tie our cable, tie it back around here and it'll start growing that way. And then once it stays that way for a while, it'll grow that way. But it has to kind of stay, it has to have that guide, that support for just a little while. If you cut it, bam, sinful nature, it pops right back. Some of us need to be putting in place some spiritual disciplines in our lives. Some of us need to be growing in Christ in the way of spiritual disciplines. Because, yeah, we want to pop right back to that sin nature. We do. We want to do it. But God says, hey, look, let me, let me show you. Let me show you a better way. Let me bring it around. You know why? Because if my branch is way out here, I got a whole lot of fruit on it, what's going to happen? Right? But if I bring that mug back into the tree and it's supported and it's growing back into the other trees, it's going to be able to produce more fruit, isn't it? It's going to be able to produce more weight. Uh, excuse me, support more weight. So, I want to invite you to look in the mirror one more time. You ready? Make your mirror. Good. I'm seeing some hearts and some ovals. That's good. All right. So here's some questions. I want you to just reflect with the Holy Spirit for a minute. You ready? Here's the questions. Yes or no. Am I an ornamental tree? Are, there signs, are the signs of life superficial? Is my purpose found in my own abilities? Am I only identifiable by what I proclaim and not what I produce? Yes or no? Do my double standard, does my double standard lifestyle push people away from Christ? So as you reflect and, and you think and you allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you, maybe you're asking the question, what can I do about it? I would tell you that really the only thing that you can do is completely surrender to the purpose and the will of God for your life. Just completely su surrender to his will and his purposes. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to start to do a work in you. And you're just going to naturally start producing fruit. Because do you think a fruit tree produces fruit because somebody told it to? Absolutely not. You know why it produces fruit? Because it's a fruit tree. Its identity is found in what it actually does. So the last tree we're going to talk about is the fruit tree. So we're, we're coming around the corner. We're headed home. I know y'all are hungry. And we're going to try to get up out of here, right? But the last thing is a fruit tree, okay? So the fruit tree is intentionally placed for the highest impact, okay? We had talked about it. A fruit tree needs to be within range of another uh, fruit tree. But have you ever seen an orchard how it's like all in rows, like all the trees are planted all in rows? You ever seen that before? Or like the soybean field, when you go by the soybean field and it's all like this right here, and so you're just mesmerized. And then you hear the and you have to get back on the road, you know, right? I mean, they're intentionally planted to produce more fruit, okay? Here's another characteristic of a fruit tree. You'll see signs of fruit in season. Um, I brought this fruit to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So did you know that there is not always fruit on a fruit tree? Did you know that? Did you know that there are some seasons that there's not even leaves on a fruit tree? Did you know that? So there are seasons where there's no fruit. There are seasons when there's flowers. And then there are seasons when it's got fruit on it. Do you know what a fruit tree is doing when it don't have fruit on it? It's getting ready. It's pulling the nutrients from the ground, and it's getting ready to produce fruit, okay? It's growing. Maybe the gardener's coming around and pruning it because he's like, man, I want it to produce more fruit this year. I see where I need to manipulate this limb and get it back where it'll support a little bit more weight. Like in the season that it's down, it's preparing for more fruit. And then in the season when it's time to produce fruit, not only does it produce fruit, but it's able to produce an abundance of fruit. It's actively being shaped and pruned. We just talked about that. It's being limbed and pruned and manipulated to be able to withstand more fruit. We said when the branch is out here, it, it's going to break, right? But it's, a fruit tree is nice and, and formed. 
It's been, it's been, it's got the disciplines put in place so that when the fruit comes, it's able to be responsible with the fruit that it's been given. I'll tell you something else about a fruit tree. Did you know that it su- supports and sustains its surroundings? Right? When a fruit tree produces fruit, what does it do? The fruit tree's out here, right? I mean, the fruit's out here, right? And then what happens when the fruit matures? Right? Okay, all right, hang with me. Now, what happens to the fruit? Either an animal comes along and eats it, right? Or a child. Um, Or it disintegrates and it rots and the seeds go into the ground and then what happens? More fruit trees, right? Yep. So not only does it sustain life around it by providing food or whatever it does, <coughs> providing nutrients, but it also produces new life. Okay? A fruit tree produces new life. Do you, why, why is it important for a tree to produce new life? Why is it important for those new fruit trees to come up? Wouldn't that be terrible if, if the fruit tree was the only one that ever, ever bared fruit and only ever had to bear the weight of all that fruit? But what if I could allow my fruit to mature and produce a new fruit tree that could bear more fruit? And then another tree that could bear more fruit. And another tree. So that sounds like the kingdom, right? It sounds like the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you, that's the plan. So overall, if you'll notice, there's healthy habits in a tree that's producing fruit. John 15, 5 says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. He's saying, if you'll stick with me, you're going to bear fruit. If you just hang with me, just stay connected to the source, you'll produce fruit. So that brings us to our last truth. It just says, a life surrendered to God is a heart postured for fruit. A life surrendered to God is a heart postured for fruit. He may even be saying, Tim, what does fruit even look like? Like, I don't even know how I would identify it in my life if I had fruit. Um, there are two different fr- type of fruits that, that uh, I could tell you about this morning, and I can tell you briefly. The first type of fruit is the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. Listen, this is the type of fruit that's produced from an intentional relationship with God and the Holy Spirit interacting with your life on a daily basis. And as He changes you on the inside, you start producing the things that you could never produce on your own. You ever tried to produce patience by yourself? You ever try to produce kindness in a tough season by yourself? You ever try to produce joy in a tough season? It's hard. Let me just tell you, you can't do it. You can't do it in a realistic way, in a genuine way, without the help of the Holy Spirit shaping and molding you on a daily basis. Then there are fruits of our labor. Psalm 128, 1 through 4 says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord and who walk in obedience to Him. You will eat the fruit of your labor... Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine uh, within your house, and your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for that man who fears the Lord. Listen to me. The fruits of your labor are not something that you conjure up, but it's something that happens with intentional relationship with other people. And as God, as you're having an intentional relationship with God and He's changing you and you're starting, starting to show those fruits of the Spirit, other people are starting to see that. And when you're intentional with your neighbors or you're intentional with the dude at the gas station or the lady at Walmart and they see those fruits, that's what creates fruits of the labor. That's what creates kingdom. People lean in, they say, what's different? Like, what does he have that I don't have? So regardless of the type of fruit, the evidence is undeniable. So maybe some of you are thinking, what do I need to do to be a fruit tree? And here's the answer. Surrender to God, his will and purposes for your life, and lean into the guidance of the Holy Spirit with a willingness to change, and fruit will explode on the scene. Some of you might say, well, why can't I just be a Christian and not have any fruit? I'm, I'm kind of content where I am. Why, why do I have to have fruit? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15 says... 
For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all. Listen, he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again in life. Listen, because of what he did for us, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for him, and we live for his purposes and his plan, and then the fruit comes. If you've, uh, if you've been here for any amount of time, you know we say, get life, give life, right? You've heard it. I said it at the beginning, you've heard it a whole bunch. And that's where that scripture kind of comes from. That, I mean, that's where that saying kind of comes from. And so it basically says that because of what he did for us, we respond in gratitude. He gave us life through his sacrifice. Therefore, out of gratitude, we give life or have fruit. The reality is, is that the first two trees are... Comp- they have no grasp on what life is. The two trees have absolutely no grasp on what life is. The dead tree was already gone and the ornamental tree is already on its way out, right? The truth is that in Christ, the ornamental tree doesn't even exist. There are only living trees and dead trees. The dead trees do not produce fruit and the living trees produce fruit. So here, I'm going to wrap up with this one scripture. Y'all ready? Ephesians 2, 1 and 10. 1 through 10 says, As for you, you were dead like the dead tree. In your transgressions and sins. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, past tense, when you, were fo- when you followed the ways of the world and of the rulers of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. We were pursuing our own purposes. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, because, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. He pursued you. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Listen, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves producing our own fruit. It is the gift of God our reason for gratitude. Not by works, so that no one can boast. You can't produce your own fruit. For we are God's handiwork, which is His Spirit working in us, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, finding purpose in Him, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That was God's plan from the beginning. I'm going to send my Son, and they're going to find life in Him, And out of gratitude, out of gratitude, they're going to do the things that I desire. They're going to produce the type of fruit that that I desire. So the bottom line is, is that there is a life that has completely surrendered to Christ, therefore producing fruit from the gratitude of the work on the cross. So listen, draw your mirror one last time. This is our last mirror talk. You ready? Yes or no? Are you a fruit tree? Second question. Where is the fruit? If you are truly connected to the source, where is the fruit? Have you received life but are content with not giving life? And maybe you're sitting there thinking, man, I got this thing down. I get life and I give life. I serve. My question for you would be, are you allowing God to prune and shape your life with spiritual disciplines to be responsible with the fruit given to you? Listen, I know today was kind of kind of heavy, a little weighted. But I think it's important for us to understand that our our fruit comes from a, just a natural response to what he did for us on the cross. 
Let's pray.